Dr. Siobhan O'Sullivan Does like knowing animals Dr. Siobhan O'Sullivan Does like knowing animals Hey people, welcome to Knowing Animals. Knowing Animals is a podcast where we speak to animal studies scholars about a piece of their work. I'm Siobhan O'Sullivan and I do like knowing animals. Did you notice that I just said, hey people? I had used to say, hey guys, but I read an article the other day saying that that encourages unconscious bias and sexism. So I'm going to try and correct myself and get better and, and not start with, hey you guys. Wish me luck. Now, this episode of Knowing Animals is brought to you by ASA. ASA is the Australasian Animal Studies Association. I have been a member of ASA for many years. I always renew my membership on time. At the moment, ASA really wants to recruit new members. Membership is just 50 Australian dollars. I strongly encourage you to become a member of ASA. It is a fantastic organisation full of wonderful people working very hard to support animal studies. So please check out ASA, the Australasian Animal Studies Association. Now this episode of Knowing Animals has a second sponsor. Yes, for the last few weeks you've been hearing me talk about MC Pony. MC Pony is a hip-hop artist. Her real name, which I can reveal now, is Elizabeth Usher. And she is a musician who is very passionate about animal issues. A lot of her music has an animal rights message. It's all available online, YouTube, Facebook, websites, etc. Check it out. MC Pony, Elizabeth Usher. She did the intro music for this uh, podcast, actually. She's a wonderful artist and you should be listening to her music. Now, wow. We are this week in the beautiful city of Leeds. The sun is shining. The English are calling it a heat wave, but it's about 22 or 23 degrees. <laughs> We've got our long sleeves on, but it is nice and sunny. And I'm really, really, really pleased to be joined by Dr. Josh Milburn. I, <laughs> did I pronounce the name? No, I said it's about right. Yeah. About <laughs> <laughs> anyway, it's tradition. Everyone at playing along at home now drink. I mispronounce our guest name. Josh is associate lecturer in political philosophy at the University of York, and today we're going to discuss Josh's article, "Chewing Over in Vitro Meat: Animal Ethics, Cannibalism, and Social Progress." And this paper appeared in Res Publica in 2016. Welcome to the podcast, Josh. Thanks for having me. So, Josh, can you tell us why you wrote this piece? Well, I've got a real interest in the relationship between animal ethics and the philosophy of food, or or you could say more broadly, animal studies and food studies. And for me, this has manifested itself in a big way by exploring the ethics of eating supposedly harm-free animal products. Um, And in vitro meat seems like a really good candidate. So in vitro meat, for anyone who doesn't know, very roughly, is a process whereby the cells of living animals are taken from their bodies and then meat is grown in a laboratory environment. Um, Now there's a lot of complications and a lot of difficulties, but I'm not a scientist, I, I don't really want to go into that too much. But another, another kind of real inspiration for me for writing this article was that I, I thought there was a real discrepancy between what um, the press and indeed academics were saying about in vitro meat and what vegans and animal ethicists were saying about in vitro meat. So often the press would just say, oh, this is going to be great for vegans, vegans are going to really support this. But actually vegans were often saying, hmm, I don't like the sound of this. So I was, I was interested to see what we could say about in vitro meat specifically from an animal ethics perspective. So in the paper, my starting point was very much the wrong of inflicting suffering and inflicting death upon animals. Um, And of course, this is the kind of ground of most arguments for veganism. It says we should be vegans, our society should be vegans, because there's a deep wrong in killing animals and making them suffer. But actually, of course, in vitro meat suggests that there's a real alternative here. As well as being vegans individually, we could uh, eat in vitro meat individually, but we could also have societies that uh, include in vitro meat in place of animal agriculture. Now, 
just let me say a little bit about my, my kind of approach, my methodology. We can very much say that this is an applied ethics question. It's a question about whether it's moral to eat in vitro meat or more moral to eat in vitro meat than other kinds of meat, etc. But I like to think of it as a political philosophy question. It's a question about what kind of society we want. And I'm interested in non-ideal theory as opposed to ideal theory. I don't want to sit down in this paper and design a perfectly just society. I want to say, how can we make our current society more just or, or perhaps less unjust? So the paper was kind of set out as exploring three kinds of objections that animal ethicists and vegans make to, to in, in vitro meat. So the first one I called the flesh as food objection. Um, so, for example, the sociologists Matthew Cole and Karen Morgan worry about what they call the fetishization of meat in society, uh, while John Miller, uh, who's a critical animal studies scholar, he worries about carnophalogocentric culture. It's a horrible word that is borrowed from the French philosopher Derrida. But basically the idea is that in eating in vitro meat, we're reinforcing problematic ideas about the place of meat in our culture. So I frame that in terms of the four ends. Now you may have come across these before. Uh, the four ends are ways that people justify meat eating. And they are that it is natural, that it's nice, that it's normal and that it's necessary. And the worry is that we reinforce the four ends when we uh, endorse or eat in vitro meat. Now, I am inclined to think that it, it can be important for us to challenge the four ends, uh, their salience, their relevance, their significance. Um, but I think it's much more important not to support the death and suffering of animals. And in vitro meat can help with this. So even if it does support the four ends a little bit, um, it might still be a good idea. Now this might sound like a consequentialist argument, an ethical argument that appeals to consequences. And I'm an animal rights theorist, and animal rights can't really make use of consequences uh, and retain its, its kind of status as a, a rights theory. But I, I am not actually sure that supporting the four ends actually violates any rights of animals. Uh, and even if they do have a right not to be, uh, not to have the four ends supported, uh, then surely their rights not to be killed, not to be made to suffer, can, can far outweigh that. And that's the kind of thing that uh, is is possible on an interest-based rights account. So the second kind of objection that I uh, that I address, and this is one that's raised in a lot of uh, vegan literature, is what I call the animals in the process objection. So first of all, donor animals, and I, I put donor very much in scare quotes there, donor animals are still needed for the process of in vitro meat. Um, and people worry about that. Now, we could have a system whereby uh, donor animals are protected. I'm not an abolitionist theorist. I believe that co-relationships with animals are possible, uh, ethical co-relationships with animals are possible. Um, and so I'm not necessarily opposed to that as long as the animals involved are treated in a fair and just way. Now, another form of this argument is that there's already been harm to animals. Um, in the process of the discovery of this technology, the development of this technology. Now, I accept that, and I accept that that's a problem. But I know that basically all scientific advancement has involved harm, whether that's to humans, to animals, or to the environment. Now, this is definitely not me saying that the harm is justified by the scientific advancements being made. I don't believe that. But the fact that it's not justified doesn't mean that we have to seek to roll back society to a pre-science uh, time. We may need to make amends for the harms that we have, uh, that we as a society have inflicted on animals, but by refusing to make use of the scientific uh, knowledge that we've acquired, everyone loses out, including the animals to whom we should be making amends. And that's especially true in this case, when the technology has such radical potential to help animals. Now, the third objection I address, and I think this is in many ways the most worrying one, and the one that I think is often actually behind the kind of objections that vegans make, uh, kind of hidden away behind their worries, I call the false hierarchy objection. So we can put this in a number of ways. I use a phrase I borrow from the German philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche, um, but we don't have to know anything about Nietzsche to, to understand the thought. I use the phrase the pathos of distance. Um, and the thought is this. In choosing to eat animal flesh, even if we do so in a way that's consistent with their interests in not being made to suffer and not being killed, we affirm a kind of pathos of distance between us and them, a kind of ranked hierarchy with humans above and animals below. Now, Sue Donaldson and Will Kimlicker, uh, in their 2011 book Zoopolis, express this same kind of concerns, concern in terms of dignity. Uh, and this too can tie to an idea of a ranked hierarchy. 
Those of a higher status possess dignity, while those of a lower status do not. And even if we don't straightforwardly harm any animals in the process of making in vitro meat, in eating their flesh, the thought is, we throw up a wall, we create an us and a them, um, that's an edible them and an inedible us, and we mark ourselves off as exceptional, as more valuable, as more dignified. And this, I think, is a real worry. And this is something that as animal ethicists and animal rights advocates and animal study scholars, we should be trying to challenge this uh, kind of distance, this separation of humans and animals in terms of value. So how can we deal with this? It seems like we have a puzzle. Either we endorse in vitro meat, but also endorse this hierarchy, or we reject in vitro meat and therefore reject the hierarchy, but in our current world, leave lots of animals to, to still die and be made to suffer uh, for the, inter the interests of humans who want to eat their bodies. Well, I suggest that we can respond to this by saying that as a society, we have a very good reason to permit the creation of any flesh for consumption not just in vitro cow or in vitro pig or in vitro chicken flesh, but also in vitro dog flesh, in vitro panda flesh, and yes, even in vitro human flesh. And my claim is that permitting the development and consumption of these kinds of flesh means that the new technology doesn't perpetuate or reify or, or, or affirm these speciesist hierarchies that uh, we might be worried about and we should be worried about. And in fact, it allows us to go a step further. It even offers us as animal activists a chance to actively challenge these species' hierarchies by affirming ourselves as animals and affirming ourselves as, as the same as animals in important uh, ways. Now, there might be other reasons to support the creation of in vitro human flesh. And I, I talk about those a little bit in the paper, but they're, they're not some, so much my central argument. Now, it may sound like this is something that people are going to object to and Often the reaction I get is that uh, people object to it, though when I talk to animal activists often they're, they're really on board with this idea. Uh, it's perhaps non-animal activists who are worried about it a lot of the time. Um, but it may sound like because it's something that's not going to be accepted by some people, that's a bad thing from a non-ideal theory perspective. Um, Non-ideal theory is concerned with feasibility. It's concerned with making real changes in the real world. So if something's not very feasible, that's, that's a mark against it from a non-ideal theory perspective. But I know that non-ideal theory is supposed to be a process. It's about a process towards a more just world. And I also know that non-ideal theory is concerned with responding to the most egregious, most, most problematic cases of injustice. And so no doubt it is the case that the death and suffering that's inflicted on animals through uh, the pursuit of, of their bodies, their milk, their eggs, etc., is a far greater injustice than the creation or, or reification or affirmation of this kind of false hierarchy that I've been describing. So I do accept that a society with in vitro meat made from chickens, pigs and cows, but not from dogs, and pandas and humans, is a far better society from the, idea, from the perspective of non-ideal theories of justice to our current society. But I suggest that one in which the creation of in vitro flesh from other animals is also permitted is better still. And I want to stress that point because that's something that some people who've responded to me, I think, have underplayed. I'm not saying that we shouldn't have in vitro meat unless we're going to allow all kinds of flesh to be made. I just think it would be better if we did allow that. Now, in the final part of the paper, I then move on to uh, perhaps the, the controversial part, I suppose, and I, I explore the ethics of cannibalism, and obviously with a focus on the ethics of eating um, human flesh that has been grown in vitro. Um, and it, it might surprise you to learn that actually it's really tricky to find arguments against cannibal in the cannibalism in the philosophical literature. It's often just assumed to be wrong. Um, in that section of the paper, I try to map out some of the different reasons that we might usually be concerned about cannibalism and show that they don't actually apply in the case of in vitro meat. So obviously there's no violence towards humans. There's nothing non-consensual going on here. Um, there may be health risks, but... Uh, we're allowed to eat things that might make us unhealthy. Um, but I do know that it's surely undeniable that we are generally very strongly repulsed by the thought of cannibalism. And some philosophers have pointed towards the idea of the wisdom of repugnance as a way to challenge certain kinds of practices that we find deeply, deeply troubling. Cannibalism is, is a common example raised here. Um, incestual relationships is, is another kind of example. Uh, and the, I'm sure listeners can think of others if, they, uh, if they've got strong stomachs. 
Now, the wisdom of repugnance maybe isn't so popular <laughs> among philosophers as it's a kind of anti-rational argument. It's saying, ignore rational argument and, and go with your gut, effectively. I, I challenge the wisdom of repugnance in this article by developing what's called a uh, evolutionary, evolutionary debunking argument against our intuitions concerning the unethicalness of, of cannibalism. Um, and this is basically the idea that we can tell a very clear evolutionary story for why we feel this deep-seated disgust regarding cannibalism, concerning uh, cannibalism's links to unhealthy diseases, uh, unhealthy uh, practices, to diseases, uh, to practices leading to ostracism and violence and so forth. So it's kind of easy to understand why we've evolved to have this reaction. But that in itself shows us that we should be cautious about attributing too much kind of moral weight to this feeling, to this intuition. It seems to have little to do with morality, the way we've evolved to think about these things. So ultimately, in the paper, I, I argue that we should have a kind of, we as animal activists and animal ethicists should have a kind of cautious acceptance of in vitro meat. We should support in vitro meat as a viable and preferable alternative to the current system, definitely viable and definitely preferable to the current system. Um, but ideally, or, or perhaps more ideally we should say, we should try to avoid um, allowing in vitro meat to perpetuate speciesist hierarchies by creating this um, edible them and inedible us. A society in which animal agriculture is replaced by in vitro meat is a society far better than our own, but a society in which there's all kinds of in vitro meat available might be better still. And I just want to close by making two quick caveats that I think points that might be missed. I've not made any claim about whether the in vitro meat eating society is better than the vegan society. That's a question for ideal theory, which is not what I'm, I'm saying here. And this might be obvious, but again, it's worth stressing. Nothing I've said in the paper suggests that we shouldn't be vegan in our current world or that we shouldn't be encouraging veganism in our current world. Wow, Josh, you've covered a lot of territory there. Very interesting. Uh, and, you know, I found the paper very interesting and, and very uh, coherent, very clearly argued. And, I mean, one of the things you've done is you've responded to some of the, I guess, question marks or concerns I had along the way. So I was busy, busily crossing out some of the questions as you were talking, some of the questions I'd prepared. So, Josh, it seems to me that one of the things that matters for me when I think about this issue, and it's something that people bring to me from time to time, the actual level or type or degree or volume of suffering involved in the creation of in vitro, the technical specifications of that matter to me. I mean, you said that you're not a scientist, you don't want to get into it. Do, do you have a general perception, though, of whether it would be possible to use this technology without creating any more suffering than has already existed so far? Yeah, I'd like to hope so. And I think one of the problems is that the technology at the moment is imperfect. And the scientists involved, uh, whether they are working for universities or working for commercial operations, are attempting to resolve these problems. So one of the big problems that's often raised by, by vegans and animal activists is the fact that at the moment, the, uh, the meat is grown on, in a growth culture, which is made of fetal bovine serum right um, and I don't want to go into too much detail as to what that is but if, if you don't know google it but be ready to be uh, annoyed um, so that's a problem right this is this is a product that the, crea the creation of which involves uh, suffering and death um, and uh, and this is something that we should object to but we do find that private companies are currently taking serious steps towards removing that and my understanding is that those that are aiming to commercialize the product the fastest are planning to commercialize it only once they have removed that um, now there's actually a lot of different companies aiming to commercialize this in the united states uh, in israel in europe um, so each one is going to have slightly different procedures and processes. Uh, and I don't want to comment in particular on any particular uh, company. My hope is, and I think this is a hope that's backed up by the actual scientific practice that's going on, that that problem can be removed. And indeed, that other kinds of problems that are raised can also be removed. So I talked, for example, about the acquisition of cells. 
that's something that we need at the moment. In principle, as far as I understand, um, this might be needed very, very little, if at all. But at the moment, it definitely is needed. So we need to talk seriously about where these cells are coming from and whether the animals whose cells are being uh, taken have lived happy lives and are, are, are being mistreated. And the reality is that at the moment, they probably are. Uh, being mistreated um, and probably aren't living happy lives. So this is something that needs to be resolved. There's a really interesting idea uh, in the literature on in vitro meat called the pig in the backyard model. Um, and this is the idea that we could have companion pigs who live in big spacious gardens as, as you know, beloved companions, members of our family. But every few weeks, we take a few cells from them and use that in a local factory or even in an appliance in our kitchen to grow uh, in vitro meat. And that's the kind of future that some animal activists and, and animal studies scholars are imagining. And that's the kind of future that I think we can get on board with. Hmm. Interesting. So from my perspective, if it were possible to grow in vitro meat without um, is bovine fetal syrup, is that what's yeah. uh, That would alleviate my, I guess, biggest concern. Collections of cells, well, like many animal processes, one could imagine it being very innocuous and one Absolutely. could also imagine it being a horrific, you know, life sentence. Yeah. If we could achieve the innocuous version, then, then that would also be morally permissible from mm -hmm. my perspective. To me, I don't have grave concern. Uh, you know, I, I like mock meat. I, I don't have any worries about ordering the chicken stir fry as long as there's no actual chicken in it. But I know some people find that morally problematic. D do you think it is true that that then creates a mens rea that affects other interactions? I mean, to me, I think if a chicken didn't suffer, then it is okay. Is that too simple a way of seeing things? You see, I'm mostly inclined to agree with you there. I think I think there are maybe some tricky edge cases, uh, but I'm not one of these people who thinks that the uh, that mock meats should be avoided by vegans. Uh, I can understand people who do think that, uh, although I, I eat mock meats from time to time, uh, and I don't have any problem with, with others who do so. Um, there's a really great paper recently published by uh, Bob Fisher and Burke Ozturk, uh, I think is his name, uh, in the Journal of Applied Philosophy on exactly this point. Uh, now, I think their arguments are very interesting, uh, but I'm not convinced that there is anything inherently problematic with these things. Now, whether it's a case of if there's no suffering, it's OK, I think maybe that perhaps is an oversimplification because there can be other kinds of duties that we have towards animals, uh, duties to not disrespect animals that might stretch beyond merely not making them suffer and not kill them. Um, but I'm not convinced that in vitro meat uh, violates any of those kinds of duties inherently. And I think, I think the, the worry that you're raising here is, is kind of a variation of, of um, the, the idea that we're reinforcing a problematic vision of where flesh belongs in our society. Um, but we can frame that in terms of a societal problem. Where does meat belong in this society, kind of sociologically, politically? But we can also frame it in terms of an individual moral uh, issue. You know, what is it that, what should our relationship towards meat be? As for this question of whether it is the case that eating these mock meats can kind of lead to us relaxing our strict rules, I think that's an empirical question. Uh, that's an empirical question for the social scientists. And my reading of the literature is that the jury's out on that. I know for my own sake that the fact I occasionally eat these mock meats hasn't led me to uh, drop back into eating meat um, or drop back into eating cheese or milk or eggs or any of the rest of it. And I'm inclined to think that that might be a common occurrence. Mm. Could you imagine a scenario whereby in vitro human flesh were being grown, people started eating it and then began disrespecting humans in other ways as a result? Would that be the analogy you'd have to think through? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. And this is a worry that people have raised uh, before. So I think especially people who have a kind of uh, Kantian bent, that is, uh, follow the German philosopher Immanuel Kant, um, get very worried about uh, this kind of idea that we would be treating humanity or treating humans as a mere means. Um, now, I'm not necessarily convinced that there is this close relationship between in vitro human flesh and actual humans. And I think that um, although we can say that this, you know, chemically, physically is meat and culinarily it can fill all the kind of roles that would be required of meat in, um, 
in human diets or in, in, in culinary practices, I'm not convinced that people are necessarily going to see this close link between um, this in vitro flesh and uh, humans. And in fact, we already know that even when there is this strong causal relationship between um, non-human animals and the meat available on our shelves, uh, research from social psychology is showing us that people don't make this connection between the two. Um, and so I'm not convinced that they're going to make this strong connection between in vitro human flesh and, and humans, at least in this way that's going to lead them to disrespect humans on, on, um, through eating this product. But this is, this is of course, un, uncharted territory, and it would be interesting to see what results that could have. Mm. Have you experienced a bit of a backlash from any vegans uh, upon writing this article? Not personally. I've, I've, I've experienced um, well, philosophical disagreement, but that's fine. I always welcome that. Uh, I've not experienced anything uh, by way of kind of aggression, aggressive responses. But I do... Uh, I am intrigued to see the, the kind of visceral response that vegans continue to have towards in vitro meat. Now, I don't... Uh, I don't pretend to have any data to back this up, but I, I am inclined to think that the vegan community as a whole is warming to it a little bit uh, now that the technology is better known. People are more aware of it. There's books being published all the time about this, newspaper articles being published all the time. And perhaps the knee-jerk reaction that many people had at first is after a little further thought um, being kind of pushed back. Although there is still, um, as I'm sure you're aware, very kind of vocal opposition to this from vegan academics and vegan activists and just in regular vegan spaces, in magazines, in social media groups, that kind of thing. Mm. I'm intrigued to see how this will change over the next few years, especially once this product is commercialised, which is only a few years away. Mm. Is this going to result in lots of vegans saying, well, OK, it's maybe not for me, but it's still something I support? I hope so. I'd mm. like to think so. I can't think of perhaps the only thing worse than in eating in vitro meat is the thought of eating actual meat. <laughs> Can you imagine many vegans taking it up as a dietary choice? I think that's interesting. I think a small proportion, perhaps. But frankly, it's not for us. No. Um, it doesn't matter whether we eat it. Yes. Um, either from an animal activist perspective or, frankly, from a commercial perspective. Because we're only a small portion of the population right now. What matters is that people who are currently eating meat transition over to it. And there's some empirical research that suggests that quite a lot of people would be willing to do that. Now, of course, there are knee-jerk reactions, people saying silly things, oh, it's probably going to give us cancer or, um, you know, slippery slope towards whatever the flavour of the month is. But I think there are a lot of people who are concerned about meat eating, perhaps for environmental reasons as much for animal suffering reasons, who would be willing to transition over to this, this technology. Maybe even not all the time, but some of the time. And that that's progress. It's not enough progress. We should want more. We should, we should fight for more. But it's at least a tiny step in the right direction. And what I'd like to see uh, in the medium term is, is a kind of very widespread move towards in vitro meat. And I think one of the things that's going to influence this quite simply is, is it going to be cheaper mm. than um, traditionally, in scare quotes, traditionally uh, grown meat? And there's every possibility that it will be. Um, at least in principle. Maybe not when it first launches, but maybe a few years after that, and especially if we start to see <laughs> a reduction in subsidies going to meat farming, um, as, as kind of people get more concerned about the environmental impact and so forth, we might see a real transition towards in vitro meat for straightforward environmental reasons, uh, sorry, for straightforward economic reasons, and that would be a good thing as well. Mm, wonderful. Well, Josh, I ask everyone who comes on Knowing Animals to answer five quick questions. Are you ready for your five quick questions? Absolutely. Can you recall the first piece of pro-animal scholarship you ever read? Uh, this is probably quite a common answer. When I was about 16 or 17, I ra read Peter Singer's article, All Animals Are Equal, uh, in an edited collection of important ethics uh, papers. Uh, and I went vegetarian not long after that. Well, there we go. That's another one for Peter Singer, and you call yourself non-consequentialist. <laughs> Can you recall the first piece of pro-animal scholarship you ever wrote? 
I remember writing a few pieces as an undergrad, but one that really sticks in my head was a piece that I brought when I was an MA student. Uh, and it was called something like uh, Non-Human Animals in the Political Philosophy of Iris Marion Young. Now, Iris Young is a political philosopher uh, who wrote a great book called uh, Justice and the Politics of Difference. And I was basically exploring something that she didn't explore, which is where do animals fit into this account? Um, now, the reason this sticks in my mind is because um, I went on to present the paper at a panel at the Manset Workshops in Manchester in 2013 called The Political Turn in Animal Liberation. And that proved quite kind of consequential for me because the people there had a big impact on my, my career. So it was organised by Les Mitchell, Steve Cook and Tony Milligan. Uh, present were people including Kurt Boyer, uh, Catherine Wynne, Guy Scotton, with whom I now co-edit uh, the journal Politics and Animals. But also present, present were uh, Alistair Cochran, Rob Garner, Andrew Woodhall, um, people who I've worked with in various ways or have influenced me in various ways. And actually, you may not remember, but you were there. Uh, I was there. I was remembering it Skype. very... <laughs> <laughs> I was remembering it. And the next year I was there in person. I missed the next year, yeah. sadly. Um, I really regretted it dearly. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so if you had to name one animal studies scholar who's had a big impact on you, who would it be? I think I'm going to have to say Sue Donaldson and Will Kimlicker. Um, they wrote the 2011 book Zoopolis, which really kind of, for me, opened up a whole new way of thinking about human-animal relationships. So I was very much trained as a philosopher, and I was trained to think of animal questions as, as kind of moral questions, not as political questions. And uh, Sue and Will really kind of shook that up in a big way with, with the publication of their book and added real kind of mainstream legitimacy to the kind of questions that, that uh, people were starting to ask. And of course, I was, I was lucky enough to uh, spend a year in Canada working with Will as, as a postdoc. Um, so their influence on me has been very large. Mm. So what's the most important thing academics can do for animals? I think that although some academics might not like this, I think the reality is the biggest influence we can have is on our students. Um, and I think that for that reason, the most important thing we can do is just raise these questions, get students thinking about human-animal relationships, uh, and especially if we work in disciplines where students might not expect to encounter human-animal relationships. So I think most people going into a philosophy department will expect a bit of applied ethics on animals, but maybe people entering a politics department where I now work uh, might not expect to encounter questions about human-animal relationships. And just asking the questions, just getting people to start thinking about them can really um, have an impact, I hope. Mm. So if you had the power to change one thing about the human-non-human -human animal relationship, what would it be? I suppose the obvious answer is that we, uh, we should all go vegan, but given the uh, paper that I've just been talking to you about, I should say a slightly more feasible possibility might be that we replace animal products in our diet with in vitro meat and similar kinds of technologies. Hmm. Now, Josh, what are you working on next? I'm continuing to work on papers uh, exploring the um, food animal ethics connection and other kinds of papers on this question of could we have um, animal products without harming animals, without violating their rights? I think that's a really interesting question. Um, I'm also working on a book which is about the ethics and politics of feeding animals, uh, including that very vexing question about feeding companion animals a vegan diet, but also about feeding other kinds of animals, including wild animals, uh, animals who live around us in our towns and cities and so forth. Interesting. Well, Josh, thank you so much for joining us for Knowing Animals, the podcast. And thank you to the listeners for joining us for Knowing Animals, the podcast, where we talk to animal study scholars about their work. Hey, don't forget to follow us on Twitter at knowing underscore animals, or you can follow me at SO underscore S. And don't forget to leave a review at iTunes. Remove your reviews, make it easier for other people to find us. I'm Siobhan O'Sullivan, and I do like Knowing Animals. <laughs>